Um, did it change? Yes. <laughs> All right, good. All right, the purpose of this clinic is to uh, give you an overview of, of Arduino, uh, show you um, how you can do it and how to learn more, uh, show you what I have done with uh, Arduino on my layout and hopefully inspire you to try them. And, um, and included in that is going to be a description of um, my uh, homemade network. Some history about me. Um, got my first Lionel train set in 1948. Um, I received an HO train set in 55. Built my first layout in the basement in 57. Got a BS degree in electrical engineering. Uh, later on, I got a master of software engineering degree. Uh, did my first micro professional microprocessor work in 77. Uh, it was a device for pay phones, if you remember them. <laughs> um, some of the first ideas about a model railroad network with a bus stuff was around 1989. Uh, I was briefly involved with the LCC working group in 2008. And um, yeah. Finally got moved into our new house in 2008 and uh, did my first microprocessor application to a model railroad in 2009. Um, experiment with servos and switch machines. Discovered Arduino 2011 at the Sacramento Convention. Um, hooked those together with servos in 2013 presented my first clinic on using servos in 2015 and um, the first uh, first installation of my network was in 2016. Uh, what is Arduino? Who is it for? What can it do for me and how can I do it? Those I presume are the questions you really want to uh, have answered and I will attempt to answer them. Uh, what is Arduino? Well, it's a family of microcontroller boards and a software system that supports them and allows you to, uh, to program them. Uh, originally, were developed in Italy um, with the intent to make microcontrollers available, more accessible to students and artists and hobbyists. Um, here's what they look like. These are these are these are mine. I took pictures of. Um, on the right, um, on the right center is the Uno. That's the one that uh, most people get introduced to in the beginning. Um, above it are the Nano and the Pro Mini, which are smaller have exactly the same computing capability as the UNO. Um, their advantage is their more compact size. Um, and the Nano has uh, more I.O. pins available. And then on the left is the, the Big Daddy, the Mega 2560, which is bigger, has a lot more I.O. pins, a lot more computing capability. Uh, just a bit of comparison. The, uh, the main three, Uno, Nano, and Pro Mini, they, they all use the same internal microprocessor chip. Uh, there's 32K of program memory. Um, there are 22 I.O. pins available on the Nano. Um, on the Uno and the Pro Mini, they don't bring all those out to the edge of the board where you can access them. On some of the Pro Minis, they are available on pads in the in the middle of the board, so you can access them if you if you if you really want to. They all have 14 digital I/O pins, and between four and eight analog pins. Uh, six of those analog pins are also dual function and can be digital I/O pins. Just as a point of clarification, the digital I.O. stands for input-output. Digital is 
it's either on or off. That's typical computer logic. It's either at ground level or at the VC supply level. That's on or off, high, low, true, false. It's, it's binary. The analog will actually measure a voltage continuously from, from zero and whatever the supply voltage is. It scales that to uh, zero to, to uh, 10,023 steps. So you could actually measure a voltage with it. With it. Uh, the Mega 2560 has uh, 256K of program memory, uh, 70 total I.O. pins, um, 54 digital, 16 analog. And I don't remember how many of the analog are dual function. I think they all are. Uh, all these boards have EEPROM. Uh, EEPROM is memory you can program. In your program that you're running on your Arduino can store data in the EEPROM. And when you turn the power off and turn the power pack on, that memory is still there. A uh, prime example of uses for this type of memory is uh, setting your CVs in uh, DCC decoders. Um, all these boards have I2C and SPI interfaces for, for peripheral devices. We'll talk about those um, a little more. Uh, most of the pins are multifunction, um, and there are a ton of peripheral devices available. And we'll go into a little more detail on, on some of that later. The software support. Uh, the programming language involved is a simplified version of C slash C++ with the, uh, with the full power of, of the GNU C++ compiler available. So it's simple, <clears throat> simple on the surface, but there's a lot of power behind it if you care to use it. Uh, the main program is called the IDE, which stands for Integrated Development Environment which combine, combines the text editor, the compiler, and program uploader all in one program. Um, the compiler is what converts your human-readable text into machine code. Uh, those of you who may be uh, have been involved in complex projects in C and other languages have learned about linkers and object files and things like that. All that's behind the scenes. The Arduino takes care of it. You don't have to worry about it. Um, uploading your program to your uh, Arduino is done via an ordinary USB port on your computer. Uh, most of the Arduino boards come with a cable. Um, the IDE and Support libraries are open source and free to download. Uh, many operating systems are supported, Linux, Windows, Apples, Raspbian, and others. Um, also, there is Arduino Create, which allows creating and uploading sketches from your browser uh, without installing software on your computer. And it, programs are saved on the cloud. Um, there are plenty of sketches, little side note, in Arduino Lingo, a program, and some people also may call it a script, they're called sketches in um, Arduino Lingo. Um, I'm used to calling, calling them programs, so I may, I, I may call them programs or sketches, but they are the same thing. Um, there's a lot of examples out there. Um, there are some you can just plug and play for applications, or you can modify them for your needs. Um, also, there are installable libraries that support numerous specialized devices and operations. And I'll talk a little more about some of those. Um, a side note about the Pro Mini. It requires a um, USB to serial port adapter to operate. 
Uh, here's an example of the IDE. Um, this is what you get when you click on a, a new sketch. Um, it, it has two built-in functions, which are part of the, uh, the big part of the simplification. Um, these two functions are set up and loop. Um, and just as the comment says, um, the setup function, uh, you put your setup code there, which runs once at the beginning when you first turn the power on, where you, some things need initialization. Um, it's going to preset some values. Um, some definitions have to be done at runtime. That's all done in setup. Um, the stuff we're doing in mono routing is real time control. Um, and and it, you sit there and do it constantly. So it, it, it does it by looping over and over again. Um, and then our global variable, the space above the setup, um, the global variables and global definitions are done there. One, one comment I'm going to make is that I'm not making an attempt to show you how to do it. Um, it this is not possible in a, in a uh, clinic like this to really teach you how to do it. Um, I'm just hoping to give you the hooks so that you can go find out how to do it. Uh, hardware, hooking it up. Um, Arduinos have a, a circuit boards they call shields, which uh, plug onto the top of an Uno or on top of a Mega. Or, or a Nano or Pro Mini will plug into a, a shield. There are many different types of specialized shields for specific functions. Um, but the primary ones that I recommend and that I use are called sensor or servo shields. There's really no difference between them. It's just um, what, what people decide to call them. And these, to me, are the most versatile. And what I recommend for uh, most model railroaders, model railroading applications. Uh, the, the bottom line is that any devices you connect to an, an I.O. pin on the Arduino is also going to need a ground or a power connection or maybe both. And the, the Arduino at best has one or two power and uh, ground pins or connections. So uh, the shields give you these, the extra ground and uh, power pins that, that you need to hook these things up. And very conveniently, uh, the pin pattern they use is the same pin pattern as a standard um, radio control model servo. So your servos just plug into the shield. Here's an example of some shields. Um, on the top um, right is uh, one version of an UNO shield. On the left is a uh, is a uh, uh, on the left is the mega shield. On the lower right is what I recommend. The configuration I re recommend for most model railroading application is a nano on a nano shield. You can see the the groups of the three pin patterns for the servos. Um, it has extra four pin patterns here for um, I squared C or I2C, which we'll talk about later. Also has a pin field here for uh, SPI. Um, it it has a, a barrel jack input and a and a voltage regulator on it, so you can power it by a wall work. So this is this is my recommended uh, configuration for model railroad applications. On the lower left is um, is my own design uh, special my shield. Uh, this this is a version that has a uh, Pro Mini on it. Here's the servo pins field. 
I like to use these two by five 10 connector ribbon connectors. So I have those on the board. And then on the end is the circuitry for my network. Um, and these four pins, um, two sets of four pins here are for um, I squared C. Just when I talk about input output devices, um, I'm talking about push buttons, toggle switches, slide switches, rotary switch keypads, uh, potentiometers, um, rotary encoders, there's light sensors, magnet, magnetic sensors, proximity sensors, uh, LEDs, numeric displays, LCD displays, uh, miniature video displays, servo motors, stepper motors, solenoids. Um, you can interface with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, RF, MQTT, uh, just gobs of it. There's, it's very versatile. Almost anything, just about anything you can imagine has probably been connected to an Arduino at one time or another. I want to mention I2C or I squared C. Um, I squared C is a two wire bus interface developed for microcontrollers to interface to complex peripheral devices. And these are very handy, extremely handy with Arduinos because in model railroad applications, you run out of IO pins before you run out of computing power. Um, upper left is probably probably the handiest. These are, it's an IO expander. There's several different kinds. Um, on the end of the board, you can see there's the SDA, SCL pins that are the um, I2C uh, signals and as power and ground and an interrupt, which is beyond the scope of this discussion. And this has 16 input output pins. And most of these can be configured to be any combination of inputs or outputs that you want. Um, down on the left is a um, PWM servo and LED driver. Um, these are very neat in that you write, you, you send the value to it for the pulse width to represent the position you servo you want and it drives the servo. The Arduino doesn't have to do anything. The, the, Servo libraries and software for, for driving servos with, uh, with the Arduino, it can do it and it does it very well, but it also takes up computing time and memory within the Arduino. With, with these um, PWM devices, uh, all that is offloaded onto the, uh, the peripheral device. So um, uh, it, it, it can be an advantage. And they can also be used, and this is where their design intended function, was to drive LEDs and be a dimmer. So you can also use them to drive LEDs and control the brightness. Um, upper right is an LCD display. Um, the one in the picture has uh, two lines of 16 characters of text. Uh, there's a larger version that's uh, four lines of 20 characters. Uh, these are driven by um, the I2C. Uh, make a note. I mean, look at the picture of the bottom of the board. Um, and notice this little black piggyback board on it. That is the I squared C um, interface board. Um, if you buy one of these, make sure you have that board. They are sold without it, and they will interface to um, an Arduino, but it will use up somewhere between four, six, or eight I.O. pins. Um, it's much nicer to use the I2C and um, the library functions to support it are exactly the same. 
Uh, upper middle is a I squared C multiplexer. Basically, what this does is take the I squared C channel um, from the Arduino and divide it up into eight individual um, I squared C channels. And so, if you have, say, you have devices that have the same address, um, this way you could connect up to eight of those devices. I, I should comment, I'll go back up a second. Devices like these IO expanders and the PWM um, driver, um, they have addresses associated with them. Um, the IO expander is up to eight different addresses, so you can connect eight of them to the same I squared C bus and control them individually. You could also tack an LCD display on that same bus and up to, gee, I forget how many. The, on the uh, PWM, they, they goes up to like 60 or something. So that's, that's really unlimited. Uh, lower right is a, is a uh, this is actually a LiDAR device. It sends out an infrared, uh, has a, uh, an infrared laser that it shoot, shoots a laser beam out and it actually measures the time, measures the time of the echo coming back like radar or LiDAR with light. And then it reads out the distance from zero to 100 millimeters. I'll show you later how I'm using these on my layout as a uh, detector for the presence of cars. Uh, resources to get started. The first resource, first place you should go is Arduino.cc. This is the official Arduino website. Uh, three key areas to look at there are the go to the software tab or software menu item and that's where you download the IDE. They have download instructions uh, for all the platforms that are there. The other place is the document documentation and the reference uh, submenu, that's where you learn about the language and the libraries. Um, the main page and the documentation shows you all the, the basic um, um, C language elements, plus um, it, it spells out all the uh, built-in functions that are the simplifications that they have built into Arduino. The other important menu area is the community forum. That's where you can go to ask questions or search for answers. Uh, there's a lot of information there. Another important resource is Jeff Blenz's blog on Model Railroad Hobbyist. Um, this is a link to it. Um, if you remind me later, I'll post that in the chat for you. Uh, um, I also want to add is if you have any questions later on um, when this program is over, feel free to email me. Um, I will post my email in the chat if someone else doesn't do it for me before then. Hint, hint. <laughs> Also, just an online search for Arduino Model Railroad. Use DuckDuckGo, Bing, Google, whatever search engine. They all show up a, a ton of, of um, sites with all kinds of information on Arduinos in general and Arduino applications for model railroading. Some are good, some are great, and some are not so. Um, another good way to get started is a starter kit. I'll talk more about that in a second. And sorry, I I don't know of any books to recommend. I, I know there's a lot out there, 
and like like on the online search, uh, they probably run the whole gamut of good to bad. Um, I didn't need them, so I never explored them, and um, I apologize that I can't recommend any. But like I said, a good way to start is a starter kit. Uh, over on the left, you can see there's these are these are just a few that I in about a five minute search I found. Um, most of these are available on Amazon, which is probably the best source to go get them. Um, Elegu, Elegu, I'm not sure how to pronounce that probably has the largest variety on Amazon. I have bought a couple little gadgets from 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 them through Amazon and they seem to be a good good outfit to do bills business with. I suppose all these others are good too, so uh, I'm not really recommending them over the other, but they do have the biggest variety. Prices range from eighteen to seventy dollars and up. Um, the main difference, two main differences in price, is one is how how much they want to overprice their product, <laughs> and the other one is how many uh, trinkets you get to play with in the kit. Uh, I've seen ads and looked at the specs for a, a model railroad specific starter kit that's out there. Um, I didn't see anything in there that, that really made it all that much better for model railroading and certainly did not justify the uh, difference in price in my mind. But what you get in most uh, starter kits, you get, you'll get an Uno um, and a wall work to power it, the internet, the ethernet, excuse me, USB cable uh, you'll get some jumper wires. Uh, we'll talk about these more later. Uh, Plug-in, solderless breadboard, all kinds of gadgets. Uh, there's push buttons, LEDs, an infrared remote, uh, sensor for the infrared remote, photo detectors, a relay, servos, uh, stepper motors. Those are two big things for modern railroading. For I use servos for turnouts. Uh, stepper motors are, can be great for animation. Um, they have um, digital displays, they have the LC, LC, LCD display. One word of warning, this may be one of the, uh, the eight pin jobs, so. Um, and there's some push buttons and a motor, a propeller. I'm not sure what you do with that. Um, tape it to your beanie, I guess. Okay, um, we'll talk about the C and C++ language. The heart of the language it used in Arduino is, is the C programming language with the added features of C++ that C++ brings to just plain sequential programming in C. It is not necessary to get into classes, methods, inheritance, public, private, destructors, this and all that. That, that's in C++, but it is available if you want to get into it. Uh, my estimation, if you can program a decoder with a Digitrax DT300 throttle or an NCE uh, throttle with just with the push buttons, or if you've learned to draw if you've learned to draw 3D models that you can print with a 3D printer, I think you have the smarts to learn to do simple programming in C if you just uh, want to take the time to learn it. Um, when you're looking online, find a tutorial to learn to program in C, or, or another good way to learn is to uh, look at examples and learn by modifying them. I'm sorry that I did not have time to to go through and find a good tutorial on C. I'm going to be working on that. Email me later, and by later I mean days or weeks. And um, if I come up with a good one, I will be happy to share what I've what I've learned. 
a uh, quick pause for any questions before I move on to uh, examples and stuff. Uh, Ted, you made reference to a shield that you had made or your own design for servos and SDI yeah. using with the Pro Mini. Is that available through uh, one of the uh, board uh, vendors? No, but no. Uh, but I, I could, I'm willing to share my design information. We can talk about that later. Okay. Okay. I, I will talk a little more about the board and other versions of it that I have. Thank you. Okay, so moving into what you can do and how you can do it. To start off, as a minimum, you could do something with just this much. Here we have the nano shield with a nano, a wall work to power it, or as an alternative, you can see the white uh, USB wall work, and there's a USB cable. You can also power it that way if you wish. And then jumper cables. Um, these are invaluable. Um, the type of connectors are called DuPont connectors. These things are called variously called 40-pin um, jumpers, uh, DuPont jumpers. Um, there's... They're readily available on Amazon. They come in four common lengths, 100 millimeters, uh, and I think it's uh, uh, 200, 250, or 150, 20, anyhow, different lengths. They come in all LGBT varieties. There's male to male, female to female, and male to female. Uh, they generally come in a strip 40 wide, it's color-coded with the standard um, brown, red, brown, red, orange, yellow, uh, the standard color code. And you can strip them down. These, these narrower strips here were stripped down from these wires. So they are extremely handy. And um, I use them a lot. And I recommend if you don't get even if you get a starter kit that has a few in them, if you're really going to get serious with this, you may want to buy an assortment of those. So here's my first simple application. There's the nano shield with the nano, um, some DuPont uh, jumper uh, wires I stripped off, cut them, soldered them to the little wires from these traffic lights that I bought off of eBay. Um, I got those either from EV models or um, We Honest, um, but they have these fine little wires, so I, I soldered them up to the to the uh, to the Dupont jumpers and plugged them into the uh, plugged them into the uh, uh, shield, and this is what we get. And I wrote a simple little program to, uh, I can see my, my audio's on. Anyhow, that's what you can do. And if, if I go back here and look at the cost, just as a round number, and a careful shopper, you can beat these numbers. Um, two and a half bucks, two and a half bucks. And I think this pair was with shipping and stuff, they were probably five bucks. So, ten bucks, you got a pair of operating traffic lights that you could put on your layout. So, you're going to have traffic lights in your town. Um, this one, I didn't even bother with the shield. Um, this is just a crossing blinker. And, and same thing, I, I cut the DuPont wires, um, soldered them to the leads from the uh, from the, uh, the the crossing blinkers, and I just plugged them in directly to the pins on the bottom of the uh, of the nano, and um, I got crossing blinkers. Of course, if you're going to grade crossing, uh, you want to you think about gates. 
Uh, this is a mock-up demo I built, made for um, a clinic I did a couple of years ago in, uh, with my NMRA clinic at Mount Vernon. Um, in case you don't recognize it, across here, those are the railroad tracks. And up and down the middle here is the street. Uh, there's a nano in a nano shield. Um, I've stripped out, I've stripped out, um, stripped out cables off of a, uh, off of DuPont jumpers to make the jumpers to connect these little photo detectors. I'll, I'll skip here today, we'll take a closer look. These little photo detectors, uh, that this has a, an infrared LED and an infrared uh, detector. Um, these are really inexpensive. Um, I think it was AliExpress one time I saw 10 of them for five bucks. Um, they have a um, sensitivity adjustment because depending on, these depend on reflected light intensity. So the, uh, the intensity of the reflected light will vary widely uh, based on what's in the background. Um, the only drawback of these, these are five millimeter LEDs, so they're kind of a pain to mount. Um, the output from these is a digital input output that, and they'll plug directly to the uh, Arduino. The only problem is that the pin arrangement is not the same as the servo, so um, you, you, you'll have to cross a couple of the pins to get the uh, to get the right connections. And the uh, pins are identified printed on the bottom of the board, so um, you just uh, connect them up by the by the labeling. So let's go back to this. Um, we have the four detectors. Uh, the two, two detectors on the outside edge will actually be spaced out farther. Um, when the train hits the hits the detector, it starts the lights flashing and the gates going down. Uh, the two detectors closer to the road um, are there to keep the gate down until the the uh, train leaves. And um, here comes the train. Um, spilled the soup in the dining car. It's a pretty rough ride. Did you notice it cleared? And the gates go up, lights go off. And the train comes back. And um, I'll go back, whoops, too far. Um, again, we talk about costs. Um, these servos are like a couple bucks, so there's there's probably not less than um, fifteen dollars or so on on what's here. The real expense is actually going to be getting working crossing gates in your scale that you can uh, connect the servos to. Um, an another application that uh, uh, there's a lot of interest in is um, lighting effects. And one of the basic ones is random lights turning on and off in a building to represent people moving around in a building and turning lights on and off as they move from room to room. Um, I put this together as a demo. And I also wanted to bring up, if, if you really get serious, another thing you you may want to get in, may want to obtain, is a crimper for crimping the DuPont pins. Uh, if you're going to be doing a lot of wiring, um, th this is very handy. Um, what I did is I bought a bunch of these pre-wired LEDs that have a resistor built in. And I crimped the DuPont 
connectors onto the ends of the wires. And then I plugged them in and I just uh, made up this mock-up for this demo. And um, the software here is, uh, I just pirated uh, one of Jeff, Jeff Bunz's uh, sketches and um, I modified it a little bit. Um, and I, what I, the modification is I speeded it up by about a factor of 20, just, just to represent, just so you get an idea of what the, uh, yeah. um, yeah, I don't know if I can kill my audio. Um, this is, this is my, this is my fancy hotel. This is, this is the Ritz Hotel, if you didn't recognize it. Okay. Um. Any questions about these examples before I go on to what I've actually done on my layout? Okay. So now I'm going to go into um, my layout and how I use Arduino on my layout. Um, I've been doing this for a while. I came into this as an electrical engineer and and professional software engineer, so a lot of it's more advanced than a beginner, and it may even be more advanced than an average user might get into. But hopefully I'll try to simplify it so that you can follow what I'm doing and see the potential for yourself. I uh, use a number of custom circuit boards, um, and as I mentioned earlier, I, uh, uh, I have developed my own, uh, my own network. Um, here's a simple, basic installation. Um, you see that in the photo of the track, um, up here where this white styrofoam block is, is, is the north end of a, uh, about an 11 foot long passing siding. Um, about three feet down is this industrial spur. And I put in a crossover uh, to aid in switching this industrial spur. So on the left, we see a control panel for that. Um, I'm an advocate of push button route control um, so rather than a toggle switch or two push buttons per turnout. Um, my push buttons select a route. So this has uh, this has uh, five servos and eight push buttons. Um, you can see I wired it. This is a temporary panel. Um, you can see I wired it up and my favorite 10 pin ribbon cable. Um, here over on the lower left is, is my, my custom uh, 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 Yeah, my custom board. Um, you can see that the control panel is plugged into the uh, to the ribbon cable connector, and then on the other side, the ribbon cable connector is is uh, <clears throat> plugged into a uh, a custom breakout board that I uh, and the five servos plug into that. Um, I did this for des testing purpose because I was plugging and unplugging things a lot. And it's a lot easier to unplug one connector for five servos than to uh, than to connect the five. Yeah, than to, to, to do the five connectors over and over. Um, so if you look at the logic involved, the the two on the ends are typical. Push the button and it throws the turnout. Um, what happens if you push the button to go into the industrial spur? Um, it'll throw that turnout, but it's so close that you really can't do any switching or anything unless this the next turnout downstream is also thrown. So pushing that one button throws both turnouts. Same thing if the uh, if you push the button here that connects it back to the main line. Uh, if you push that button, it also lines the uh, the turnout downstream from it. And as we 
if you're familiar with crossovers, you know that if if you throw one turnout on the crossover, he almost always should control. They should throw the other turnout. Um, so when you push this button, it actually will throw all three turnouts. Uh, if just for control, if you want to control for the crossover, you push the button in the middle. It throws the two turnouts for the crossover. Push the mainline button, and it throws both crossover turnouts back to the mainline. So the number of actual savings and the number of push buttons here is not that great, but um, it is a simple example. The next one is a much this is a much better example of the uh, number of the savings and the number of buttons with a uh, using the route route control. Um, the photograph on the right <coughs> is a, uh, a hidden storage yard that I had installed in my layout. Uh, it has since been removed. Uh, th this is actually my first application of uh, servos and, and the Arduino. Um, you can see on the upper left the uh, the control panel has uh, 10 push buttons, and uh, there are seven servos that are connected. Um, just an example, if you push this push button down here for track one, it actually will throw one, two, three, four, five turnouts with one button. And likewise, um, the others turn throw fewer, but you just select the track you want, push the button. The logic written in the program um, throws the turnouts for you. Um, here is a um, an Uno shield on an Uno. Um, here's the seven servos plugged in directly to the Uno shield. Now, one thing you, you if you count wires and stuff, if there's seven or ten push buttons, you wonder where are the ten wires? Well, um, I came up with this resist, resistance ladder or resistance divider circuit that allows me to uh, monitor up to 16 push buttons and uh, monitor it with just one analog pin going into the Arduino. Um, when you push one of these buttons, it sets up one of 16 different voltages on this pin going into the Arduino. And um, and the, uh, the software in the Arduino can uh, uh, look at that voltage level and determine which, uh, which push button is being pressed. Um, I wired this thing up on a piece of perforated board. Um, this, this, this row of connectors across here is for connecting the push buttons. Uh, I've got either pins or screw connectors for the, uh, the ground side of the uh, push buttons. And down here are the three pins in that servo connector arrangement that uh, plug into the Arduino. Power, ground, and the, uh, the, voltage, the voltage signal. Okay, um, when I mentioned I did my first microprocessor controller application on the model railroad was, was for this staging yard. And the, um, the control panel in the upper left uh, represents the track diagram. The idea of this is the main line, the, the, the line down from the, uh, the layout comes down on this upper track. You go down around partway around the loop and back the train into the uh, staging yard. Uh, this was completely hidden, and uh, the goal was to be able to operate it just by monitoring the lights. And like I said, I, I did this initially with a different processor board, um, hand-wired all these LEDs and push buttons, and um, 
it had some problems and I decided to do it over with Arduino. Um, first thing, let, let's talk a little bit about what's on this board. There are 39 LEDs and nine push buttons. And I did not cherish the idea of wiring up 48 devices again. So I designed these circuit boards, uh, worked out this arrangement um, with these push buttons and the LEDs that'll poke through holes in eighth inch masonite. And I made this panel. If we go over to the lower left, you can see the back side of those those circuit boards, the three red boards that, that are piggybacked onto the back of these, the panel boards are um, I squared C um, IO expander boards. Uh, 16 IO pins each, three of them, that's 48. That handles my board nicely. Um, if you notice the traces down here, these are the these are the two wires, the two signal lines for the I squared C, and they just go from this board to that board to that board. There are solder pads on the I/O expanders that select the address. Have to excuse me a second. I'm getting my throat's getting dry. <coughs> and. <clears throat> It connects to the Arduino with four wires, the, the two I squared C wires and power and ground. I use my my favorite 10 pin ribbon cable uh, just for convenience. Up above you see um, one of my um, one of my custom shields um, with a nano on it. Um, these connectors down here are the I squared C connections. Um, I'm trying to remember which. Oh yeah, and they're connected through uh, the breakout board here. This is the this gray cable coming off here is the connection for the uh, for the control panel. <coughs> um, the turnouts on this on this yard are, are uh, powered by tortoises. Uh, these four devices, um, these four boards side by side here are, uh, they're dual H bridges, which are what you need to drive a DC motor like a, uh, like a tortoise. Uh, each board can drive two of them. Um, and they're connected through these ribbing cables cables up to these breakout boards and up at the top of the individual wires going out to the tortoises. Um, let's see. Oh, and the red board down in the middle here is, a, is another IO expander that drives the H bridges that drive the tortoises. Uh, one note is if you're going to drive a tortoise with an Arduino with uh, H bridges like this, so it's a very nice uh, plug and play sort of arrangement. Um, it takes two IO pins to drive a tortoise. And um, yeah, uh, just some of the statistics on this staging panel. Uh, like I said, there's 39 LEDs and nine push buttons on the panel. Um, I'll back up a second. On the panel, um, on the right, you see these amber and red LEDs. There are photo detectors that detect when the end of the train is approaching the end of the track. The amber comes on when it's about one car length, uh, four or five inches. The red LED comes on when it's about an inch or so from the end. And uh, like I said, there are photo detectors for each of those. Um, these, these, the red LEDs that zigzag through here, these are at the fouling point 
uh, this is the point where if you part, leave a car on that, that spot, a car going by on the adjacent track might run into it. So these, uh, these LEDs indicate the clearance. And then also there's two other LEDs to indicate when your train has cleared these turnouts. So there are photo detectors for, for all of those. So the nine push buttons, there's 16 photo detectors, um, 16 pins driving, uh, eight tortoise machines. So that's for a total of uh, 89 input and output pins. Um, a lot of the concentration is taken care of by, of by my network. But with all of that going on, I mean, that's that's a lot of I.O. pins. And remember, I said you run out of I.O. before you run out of, uh, of uh, programming power or memory. Uh, the software that runs all that takes up only 26%, barely over one quarter of the program space in the Arduino. And it takes up a third of the dynamic memory or the RAM. So there's a lot more horsepower in an Arduino than you need for a lot of model railroad applications. I mention this because you hear a lot of talk about people thinking you need to use, uh, go to with a with a um, Raspberry Pi or a Pi Pico or um, there's a bunch of different 32-bit uh, uh, boards out there. Um, it's way overkill. Um, I don't, an analogy I thought of is you need to move two boxcars. If you you could move those with a little, uh, you could move those with a little uh, yard goat, or if you wanted to move up to uh, say an SW fifteen hundred, that would be like moving them with an. Uh, that's like working with an Arduino. And then if you go to a, a, a Raspberry Pi, that's like getting out a UP big boy to move those two box cars. So the dilemmas that I was facing and I think some others might be facing are, how do you control turnouts from multiple locations? Uh, when you get into signaling, what do you do about a signal where the signal is here, but the, the detector for the the track is uh, four feet or 10 feet away. Uh, what if I want a remote display of uh, the routes of turnout alignment or signal aspects? Um, or then what about tying into uh, to JMRI? Well, the answer that came to me some years ago is a network. Now, LCC could do it, and um, we asked why not, and why did I not use uh, LCC? Well, I started on this implementation well before the LCC equipment was available. I think my network's simpler and more flexible than uh, LCC. And later, more recently, just in the last uh, few months ago, I reviewed the LD LCC devices available from the LCC manufacturers, all one of them. <laughs> and this is what I come up with. Um, for three nodes that I'm working on, uh, is a total of what I would need for LCC. I would need three of the uh, railroad circuits, uh, tower LCC boards, I would need to drive servos, I would need an um, Tam Valley Octopus is probably one of the best options. And um, I came up with a total of uh, 457 bucks. Um, I did an estimate on, on my node boards and IO expanders and I, I, I estimated high and I came up with $100. So um, that to me is one incentive why I'm not considering switching. And like I said, I for me, my network is a lot a lot uh, more flexible. Um, 
I used to work with a guy that insisted we come up with a catchy name for products we were developing. So I came up with this for my network. It's I call it Sinbab, which is a simple but adequate adaptable bus. Uh, oh, and uh, it is definitely the tinkerer's version of LCC. It is not plug and play. Oops. Uh, a word of warning: there's no software available for this, uh, and I will am not. I'll coach, but I'm not providing software for it. Um, so it's anyone who's not willing or able to program in C, C++ for Arduinos, uh, this is probably not for you. However, I will add that the kinds of things I'm doing with this can be done with LCC. So what is it? Um, it's a peer-to-peer -peer bus. Uh, any any node can transmit or receive. All nodes are of equal importance. That's why it's peer-to-peer. -peer. Peers are equal, so they're all equal. It's a single twisted pair of wires that carries the data in both directions. Um, the driver circuit is a simple open collector NPN transistor. It's uh, it's essentially a wire to war connection. Uh, use a five volt signal level, standard serial eight bit one start one stop no parity. Uh, idle state is is a logic one or high idle state, just like. Um, Standard serial, the standard serial port that's built into the Arduino. Um, standard serial port that used to be on our computers. Um, same, in essence, as RS-232. Um, I've operated a test over, a, I have a 400-foot coil of a Cat3 foam wire. And um, I transmitted signals at 115 k baud with no problems. And I've implemented with this with the Arduino, uh, this the small 32 k uh, Nano Uno Mini Pro Mini. Here's a schematic of the driver circuit. Um, transmit pin uh, connects to an LM. 393 comparator that simply acts as an inverter to drive the transistor, which drives one side of the bus with a pull-up resistor. Um, on my individual boards, I put 100K, so there's some pull-up there for testing, but when it's connected to the connect to the network, um, one node has a 390 ohm um, pull-up resistor, which is the terminating resistance for the uh, terminating resistance for the network. Um, the receiver is uh, the other half of the LM three ninety three. Um, it's it it's just pretty much basically a um, a high impedance forty seven k input impedance um, with a little bit of feedback for hysteresis drives the receiver pin on the Arduino. Um, these 393s are uh, open collectors, so there's a pull-up resistor to pull them high. I put an LED on it um, just so I can tell when there's activity on the bus. I said this bus is a twisted pair. Um, I bought a 100-foot spool of each of these 24-gauge uh, solid wire. I clamped one end of them in the vise. I unspooled all 100 feet out out the length of my driveway, chucked them in the electric drill, and I twisted them. And then um, I ended up stringing it around my layout. My layout is a, sort of a J shape. So I, I strung this around the layout, and I think the what I have is uh, installed on the layout is about 60 feet of that. 
So how does it work? Um, the software protocol, um, it's event-driven. Uh, inputs produce event codes, very similar to LCC. All intelligence is at the receiving end. Um, when an event occurs, multiple receivers could respond to an event or they could ignore the event. Uh, the packet format is uh, expandable. Uh, central control is not required, but it, it could be included. And um, JMRI interface is possible. Uh, event code is, um, event code packet is two bytes plus a checksum. Um, most significant bit of the first byte is a zero. That leaves 15 bits for over 32,000 event codes, which is adequate for all but the largest layouts. Um, the MSB, the first byte of an expanded packet is a one. From there on, the packet length is is whatever you want. You, know, you can do whatever you want with the remaining remaining bits of the packet are more bytes, which makes it adaptable. Event codes are gener are generally invit triggered by the state of change of an input, like when a button is pressed or the train enters a detection block or leaves a detection block. It's the change that um, creates the event code. Um, on the Marvel World, things aren't happening that often. Uh, it's relatively low rate of, uh, of event codes being produced. Um, with the way I have it set up, I estimate that uh, I could handle 1,200 packets per second. And 1,200 events per second is um, pretty active and or a pretty large layout. So um, one of the problems with a network like this is collisions where two things try to transmit at the same time. Um, my solution for collision mitigation is uh, I transmit event codes twice and separated by each each node has a different delay time between um, between transmissions so if two of them happen to collide on their first transmission the retransmission will be staggered so they they, they should get the message through without without a further collision and also, and I'm in my de my detectors like the uh, fouling point point detectors and such. Um, I'm adding software so that periodically um, it will transmit event code to, in essence, um, repeat the state of that um, of that output. We get into some of the applications of. Um, the network. This is the first. This was the first one I did, and it was experimental. Um, I broke this up into three nodes, which I probably could have done the whole thing with one node. Um, if you look at the track plan, I have this uh, passing siding coming down. I have an industrial spur off of it, and then this uh, um, other turnout here. It's a uh, a cutoff that uh, um, to cut off to go head into the uh, staging, which is down at the at the lower down at the bottom here. Um, you see the track plan. Um, there's eight push buttons that are that are actually hooked up. Um, the eight push buttons are connected to this. Um, this nano on one of my shields, uh, and it's literally just double sticky taped to the back of this panel. And um, 
and then it, 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 I started out using uh, RJ45s for the network connection, and this I have since changed to that uh, the the tap line that I showed you. So this node is the control panel. Um, this node up here controls these uh, the three turnouts up here at the end of the passing siding, and the node down down below on the left controls um, controls these two turnouts. Um, it used this node used to control the upper end of this passing siding, but I changed that, and I'll show you that later. These two push buttons still control that upper end of the passing siding. So this is the node for, um, you look at the tech trap diagram on the lower left, um, you see there's the upper end of the passing siding, and then um, a little further to the left is the lead in to my yard, um, which <laughs> is my former yard. I decided that I just did not like the way that was working. And this is all of this blue and on this control panel, this lower part. If you may notice behind me, when I stopped sharing, this control panel is gone. But um, <clears throat> This was an experiment using these, uh, they're called tactile LEDs. It's a push button that has an LED built into it. Um, and um, the problem with them is they're, the pins on them are very delicate and you, you, can, you cannot, you would break them off if you tried to hand wire, so they have to be on a circuit board. So I made, I made up circuit board that could cut into strips and it's hard to see, but there's these, you see these, these uh, five are in a nice straight line. Well, that's this board up here. And these other two are mounted on this board. Uh, these are wired together into uh, one of those IO expanders. And the connection to the uh, Arduino is this, uh, this, this four wire cable which is the I squared C cable. Um, off the picture on the same control panel are push buttons to control this uh, left end of the yard entrance. And um, as luck would have it, there was a, um, a vertical support um, right in the way. And uh, rather than, rather than um, try to route wires around it. I tried connecting with this copper foil so that um, that the panel will will still press right up against that support and and there's no bump or anything. So that's that's what the copper foil is about. And this other strip of copper foil up here with these resistors is because I made a stupid de design mistake and forgot to include pull up resistors for the uh, the uh, push buttons. And then the node board itself is down below. Um, you can see the, uh, I, the I squared C connection uh, at the bottom. And then my ribbon cable and breakout board uh, connected to the servos. Um, so these push buttons are route control. These two buttons control that upper passing siding. The two buttons on that other panel control this this turnout also. And when you throw the turnout with that other panel, the LEDs here change. And then another node, this is the, the node that has the servos for that left end of the of the yard. And um, uh, this is an exp this was an initial experimental installation. Uh, this was that board I made for those tactile LEDs, and I just I just stuffed it with these um, eight buttons um, and wired them to this this lash up with this ribbon cable. And this blue board on here is another I/O expander. And um, again, uh, these resistors are uh, 
taking care of my screw up and not uh, providing pull up resistors. But anyhow, these um, these push buttons, uh, ML6 is mainline six, yard access one, yard, ex yard access two are these for these routes into the uh, yard. Um, the ISN stands for industrial siding. Um, that's for this turnout down here. And just for the heck of it, uh, I put in two buttons also to control that um, that same passive siding. I uh, probably don't need it, but um, like I said, it's experimental. Yeah, you, you have to excuse me again. <coughs> And like I said, this the blue yard, that blue yard trackage is all gone now. I've started a new smaller yard. It's going to be much more uh, convenient and uh, much more in keeping with the overall size of my layout. The yard I had before was two to three times as big as I really needed. So what's new? Um. Uh, Come on. There we go. Um, okay, my mouse clicking is. Uh, all right. Uh, here's one of my latest installations. This is. Uh, this is my newest node board. Um, it takes a, a nano. Um, here on the end is my is my the receiver circuit. And um, now for those, I've switched away from the RSJ, the RJ forty fives, and uh, I use uh, I use these uh, JS little two pin JST connectors. And um, drop wires off the uh, the network, like I showed you, where I just scrape the insulation off the uh, off the bus wires and solder these drops. And the reason I'm using these, and the reason the color is different, is I bought a bunch of these that were pre-wired with red and black. I would have preferred the uh, the uh, white and green that I used for the bus, but I'm stuck with the red and black. Um, This, uh, this is this, like I said, this is my node. I call it a node board because it is a node for my network. I have a uh, five volt regulator on it, so I power it with 12 volts. It has uh, several pins brought out to two sets of eight with the remedy connectors. Uh, I squared C, two sets of I squared C connectors. Uh, one of the changes is this outside one with. Uh, inserting jumpers in these pins, I can select whether the power going out is uh, 5 volts or 3.3 volts because some of these peripheral devices, like the ones I'm, I'll am i show you here in a second, uh, run on 3.3 volts. So. And then um, the, there's, these take care of 16 of the I.O. pins. Um, the other Four other I.O. pins. Um, I have pads here where I can solder pins, and I just didn't. I didn't. Uh, I just didn't populate them. And if you're counting, you'll you'll, you'll follow that I'm two pins short. And the reason for that is I use two pins because I use software. I use software serial for the uh, um, for the bus. I do not use the built-in. Um, I do not use the built-in serial port for a couple of different reasons, which are beyond the scope of this. <laughs> Anyhow, here's here's the installation. Um, these are two of those um, I squared C multiplexer boards that um, that is, in essence create um, individual I squared C buses. Um, all this cabling connects to uh, and all the detectors for the fouling point and those 
turnout clearance points are um, I have a scaled engineering I squared C or um, IR sensors and they are um, they're, they're not the full train spotter they're uh, they're just the infrared sensor on a little board and and uh, you access them through I squared C one of the difficulties with them is they they all have the same address so you cannot connect multiples of them on the same uh, I squared C bus you have to use a multiplexer like this so that's what these are these are came from uh, spark fun um, they just plug in and these also require 3.3 uh, volts so all these wires go off to those sensors that are mount they mount uh, from underneath in a 3 8 inch diameter hole uh, sorry I didn't get a good photograph of those but I did have a problem spot right here on track six and seven in the staging yard. Now you can see here's a here's a um, here's a one by two riser right here, which means that right below this is a uh, is a joist, and the L girder in this area is about directly below this rail. So there was no way I was going to drill a three-eighths inch hole up from the bottom. Oh, and, and then up above, this is the hidden staging. Up above, you can see it. this is about eight inches or so is the upper level of the layout, which um, I can't get an electric drill in there. So, so what I did is I took one of those VL6180s that measured distance and I aimed it across the track. And the software looks at the distance of what it's seeing. Now, if what it's seeing is oh, three and a half or four inches or farther away than that, then both tracks are clear. If what it's seeing is about two and a half to three inches, then track six is occupied. Or, and if what it's seeing is about an inch, inch and a half away, then uh, track seven is occupied. And um, uh, I've got that set up, and that, that's working pretty well. So that was, uh, I mentioned earlier, those um, I squared C devices and the, the distance measuring. This is one application for them. Uh, on the right is another application. On the ends of those the staging tracks. I have these mounted so they're looking down the track and the software looks at the uh, at the return. When it's farther away than, than 100 millimeters, um, both LEDs are off. When it's closer than 100 millimeters, the amber LED is on. And when it's closer than 20, 25 millimeters, the red LED is on. And um, these seem to be working pretty well. So I'm pretty pleased with the results. You, you can see this white paint. You can see one of the old photo detectors that uh, I couldn't get out. I, I, I'm not sure. I think I super glued those in. Um, just a quick overview of the software. Um, I divide my the, the software into two main parts. One is... Uh, uh, I read the inputs, generate the event codes, and I transmit the event codes. That's one function. And um, in my main loop, uh, that's usually just a function call. And that, that goes off and happens. The other part of it is, is, receiving, oops, is just to receive and respond to event codes. And even things that are happening in the same in the same node, um, like what I showed you, the, the panel there that had both push buttons and controlled switch machines, the signal path is still out over the network and, and, and received. Um, I do it that way because if I want to make a change, 
like I moved that one servo from the one node to the other node. Um, it's, it's just events on the network as the coupling between those devices. So I could do that without with, with only changing the uh, the network signaling and, and response. Um, one of these, I have all these nodes and they're sharing event codes and stuff is I, I created a master.h file, a header file that um, I do a define of all the uh, of all the event codes and all the stretches in the nodes uh, include the, that same master.h file. So that's how I I keep track um, and make sure everyone's talking to the same talking the same language. Um, the goal was to keep the cost of the node board low, so that cost was not an issue for adding a node. Uh, that's why I came up with the custom node board with the uh, with the transceiver circuit. Uh, the initial one had a sockets for a nano or a pro mini with a variety of I/O. Um, I, like I said, I started out using the RJ45, but I got away from that. Did this twisted pair. Um, more and more, I'm using the I/O expanders and the PWN multiplexers. Um, it it it's um, it, it makes for a convenient way to hook things up, and um, um, and in some cases, the software is simpler. And particularly, I like the uh, the unloading the uh, uh, servo stuff from the uh, from the Arduino. This one of the problems with any of the servo libraries is the servos using timers and interrupts and stuff, and 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 that can interfere with some other functions, um, some other devices and functions on the Arduino. So. If there's an opportunity to offload that to another device, I'll do it. And these PWM multiplexers are a good way to do that. And they're not very expensive. Um, my goal is, well, my control panels will just connect with three or four connectors, three or four wires, either either mount a, mount a node on the panel or use the I2C or use that resistor divider. Um, so what are I headed in the future? Um, signaling, um, signaling may require the, uh, the implementation of a state machine. I have some ideas on that. Um, if you don't know what a state machine is, it, 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 it remembers something that's been set so that, um, with, when a thing is event driven, like the train, the train moves into a, uh, a, a, a detection block. Um, it only sees the event when it enters, and it sees another event when it leaves. And so you need the state machine in the software to remember that that block is occupied. Now, like I said, I, I back up by repeatedly transmitting that state, but uh, it's, it's still needs to remember that. Another thing that can be done is structure lighting and animation control. Um, you could do this over the network. Um, JMRI, um, I use a USB connection to, uh, to the computer. Uh, I've installed a Mega 2650 uh, to do that. Um, I use the Mega 2650 because it has four serial ports. And um, uh, so I can use one of those for the uh, for the network, and the and the other one for uh, for the uh, JMRI um, USB interface. With JMRI, there's all kinds of possibilities. The inter the it could interface to control turnouts by JMRI panel. Um, one idea that just hit me. I plan on using the JMRI's operations um, train uh, operation software for generating switch lists and train orders and such. And um, 
one one harebrained idea I have is when you push the build button on the JMRI ops to create the orders for a new train, uh, to physically out on the layout on the depot is have the semaphore train order board raised to the uh, or, or lower to the uh, orders pickup position. So I don't know if that's possible, but that's just one of my pipe dreams. And then the other the other thing that's like kind of a pipe dream is uh, using software serial uh, is advanced collision mitigation where I could actually, with software serial, do a bit-by-bit test for uh, collision. Um, I don't know if that ever happened, but that is a possibility. And that is the end. And if there's anybody still awake, uh, <laughs> ask questions. Are you so overwhelmed? <laughs> well, I tell you, you covered uh, an awful lot of material, Ted. I. I tried to warn you. <laughs> oh, listen, I, I can't tell you how, how appreciative I am of it because I keep hearing that uh, young people coming into the hobby are, are, are going to uh, stay in the hobby because of technology. And certainly this is uh, one part of technology I think a lot of people may get interested in. So, Ted, yeah. just a couple of quick questions. So, you know, you developed basically your own bus version, which, you know, obviously may have some cost advantages over the uh, CAD bus that's used in LCC. I, I, but, I mean, from the perspective of the rest of LCC, when I've looked at LCC, LCC basically are these nodal processors that have a CAD bus between them, and the whole application structure, the architecture is based on a publish and subscribe model. I mean, basically what I think you've done is essentially begun a replication of that with a what would be argued as a simpler bus that may be more cost-effective related to a model railroad environment um, but basically with simple Arduinos has a publish and subscribe model. Is that a fair statement of the kind of the whole bus discussion? Because I think it was very detailed, but I want to kind of bring it back to how it could actually be utilized by folks. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, I, like I said, I don't, um, I, I said this is a tinkerers and a programmers uh Alternative to LCC, and I, I don't, I don't know for sure that, that many people would actually try to duplicate what I've done. Um, well, I mean, it, you know, the whole concept in the world now is you don't duplicate, you reuse. So, I mean, you know, the, the question is, you know, have you put the stuff up on GitHub so people can get it? Because I, I mean, the concept of saying. You know, the, so so the thought process here, I was thinking about when I listened to that, the, the last part of this, because for most folks here, that was probably, I mean, I'm assuming most folks, it went over your head. Um, you know, the concept of bus structures and how you do buses and how you do distributed architectures is kind of a fairly advanced concept. Uh, but But the interesting perspective is, there were kind of two options there. One would be to kind of use the, L, you know, use the LCC structure and replicate it in your own code. Um, I mean, what you did was basically replicated something different. And the question is, does it make sense to kind of put that out somewhere where people can get it and try it and add to it? Because the basic underlying protocol should be the same. And, and then the other question I had, which was, which is actually something that I started to think about as you talked is, um, if you look at the, ICE, the um, I2C bus, there actually are some extender chips for that bus, and there are some fairly simple ways to have Arduinos talk to each other using that that bus. I was wondering if you I was wondering if you considered that as an option as an interbus architecture instead of kind of a, a different bus that requires a whole set of um, characteristics. Yeah, I, I touched on that. Um, well, it, it came up after I had started going this way. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I, I, I squared C is very much a master slave environment. Yep. 
It's very much a master-slave environment. So, um, yeah, you could probably do it, but... Um, but you really wanted to create, again, the peer environment I, with... I wanted to do the straight peer-to-peer -peer environment, yeah. Yep, with a public and, uh, subscribe model. And, um, and, 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 yeah, and that's the LCC concept also. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and, um, and to me, that's the most flexible way to go about... <laughs> Especially in an environment like a model railroad, um, and I've I worked on bus environments. So I worked a lot in um, avionics. <laughs> um, so if some of them probably don't never recognize the Eric four twenty nine or Eric six twenty nine. Know what those mean? But but those are bus environments that you were used on airplanes. Are used on airplanes. Um, but. Um, yeah, the, like it. Yeah, the, I, I just see you can do communications between Arduinos, but it works best on a one to one or one master multiple slaves. <coughs> and I have one question. Is Pat Regard here? Mm -hmm. The use of the stepper motor can it be used with the uh, 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 with the Adreno and the use of a turntable? Definitely. It would be strong enough in all scale? Oh, in all scale? Well, that particular little stepper motor that's in those starter kits, probably not. You'd have to get but a bigger one. Definitely find stepper motors that, that will drive an all scale turntable. And Patrick, the, the way to think about a turntable, because I actually been, we've been playing with this is, you can actually set up the turntable so you align it with rails mm -hmm. and you put inputs, which actually, so in other words, you can set the turntable up where you, you zero it at a point where it's an inbound track mm -hmm. and it's now counting as the stepper moves around. So you, you can move it. it, you can actually set up a couple of buttons that actually allow you to move it around manually and move it to a point and then enter a code that says, now it's aligned at that stepper point with this track. Okay. And and then in the programming and, and Ted can talk to you a lot about how to do this, you can actually you can actually make the decision to find the optimal path, but what you can do is you can decide that it never goes three hundred and sixty degrees. Yep. So it always you know, it starts here coming in and it either goes this way or it goes this way. And if you're in this stall here and you want to go to a stall over here, it actually goes all the way around. And by doing that, now you don't now you can actually just have two wires coming out at the bottom. You don't yeah, have to have the rails for power because you control the directionality in the software. It's a really interesting set of thought processes. You can auto align, and then all you have to do is move it to the main track at a zero, and now it's it's realigned for the future for any movement. So yeah, it's a really powerful tool for that. Good. Uh, if you guys I, want the code for exactly that? I have it. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Uh, that figures. <laughs> we we uh, 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 we did this on our. We did this on our uh, HO club layout uh, yep. with, uh, I think it was nine stalls. And we did exactly that. We, we used it as a, with a code. And, and uh, yep. uh, one of the guys who is an Arduino guy. Now, I'm going to say something to all of you electronics guys. That's fantastic. You love that shit. But the hobby is model trains. You're in another rabbit hole. <laughs> we have to make this really easy for all us grandpa guys who are into model railroading. Well, my son-in-law is quite knowledgeable, and he's in robotics, so he's going to set it up. Well, yeah, he'll get in the hill. <laughs> but, 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 but the cool thing about it, Clark, is that you guys have a sketch that somebody wrote. And if you know if that's published, then somebody can start with that. And you yeah. know, it, 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 so what's interesting is that actually the thought process here is it allows you to simplify Mm -hmm. A lot of the underlying things that we used to spend a lot of time trying to do in other ways and maybe focus more on modeling. Well, right. that's, that is, that is a point. But as I always say to guys in the electronics who know what they're talking about, explain it in the fact that uh, grandpa has no effing idea. He just learned how to use the VCR. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Grandpa doesn't even know how to use the VCR yet. <laughs> uh, but, but I, I will tell you this. I, uh, 
Could I reclaim my my clinic? You sure can, Ted. <laughs> All right. Uh, back to the person who was asking about the circuit board. Um, email me and we'll we'll talk about it. Okay. okay. All right. Thank thank you, Ted. Uh, um, it's going out to you uh, now. Also, I I, wa I want to emphasize that. So well, first of all, uh, I know this is not for everybody. Yeah. And I'm not advocating that a lot of you get in there and try it. I'm just, I was, you know, I was just showing what's available and what can be done. Um, on the topic of turntables, I've, I've done a lot of, written a lot of notes and did a lot of designing and trying to figure out how to power a turntable. And when Uncle Sam sent me a COVID check last spring, I bought a Walther's automated turntable and the advanced control module. <laughs> <laughs> it is doable. Well, Ted, I have got it working now, but I've got it on the, the power to the turntable, all set up and working, but I don't have a stepper motor on it. And my son-in-law wants me to put a stepper motor on it so it simplifies the turning Raises. Yeah. He says he can make it go forward and reverse if I want. Right. So I said, okay. Like, 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 like Clark was saying, if you if you if you connect it to an Arduino and uh, yeah. you will you you really want to have a single point reference to tell it um, to know where it is. That's right. Point. Um, and then. And then it, it, it monitors where it is by counting steps. And these steps are pretty small. It's like the fraction of the width of the rail. So That's what he was saying. Um, and the, the, the logic and the way to, to set up the Walther's turntable is pretty much the way what, what um, uh, Clark was describing. Now, a friend of mine, an O-scaler, hmm. has one of those... Um, System has been around for ages. New York or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah. New York indexing, I think it's called. And that thing is when it's working, it's beautiful. But if it gets lost or the programming is screwed up, he has to go through from the beginning and reprogram every stall in order, hmm. or from where the default is. It's it's. The, it, it's the way it's programmed. It's it's got to be in sequence. Uh, the way the Walters is done, and the way the way Wal uh, Clark was describing, uh, the way a typical programmer would program it in an Arduino to control it, um, it, it would be easier to uh, easier to reprogram if you want to change it because you just. You line it up manually, and then you push the button and say, "This is track seven. And this mm -hmm. time you punch track seven, that's where it'll go. That's what he told me. Yeah, yeah, that's how it. And that New York, that New York system is not like that. Yeah, yeah. If you guys and need I, to, I'd call. love to get my hands on one of those and reprogram it. Put 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 an Arduino on it. <laughs> Thanks, Ted. Yeah. Um. It, in the in the framework of what I do with the NMRA Fourth Division of the of the Pacific Northwest Region, um, I, I did a, about twelve sessions this spring on Arduino, and I'm going to be very likely starting those in the fall. Um, and and there, there's there's we get down to the nitty gritty and 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 teaching more teaching you how to do things and answer questions. If you're interested in that, um, one, send me an email, and two, if you want to go to that avenue and, and get on all those sessions, is um, access the 4th Division PNR newsletter, on online newsletter, it's called The Grab Iron. If you do a search for 44dpnr.org, uh, that should put you there, and I will be posting announcements there if and when these classes start. I'm still a couple people short of the threshold where it, I think it'd be worthwhile, but um, 
I, I'm making that available. And like I said, I'm always available uh, on uh, email to ask questions. And I see that Ken just posted my uh, my email address again. So 